Hi everyone. Tonight's video <clears throat> is on ATP, phosphorylation, and the ATP cycle. So many processes are spontaneous. They don't require any outside energy, such as this ball rolling downhill. It'll do this without any added energy at all. Even in the cell, there are processes that don't require energy, such as diffusion. Diffusion is when molecules move from a high concentration to a low concentration, ultimately forming an equilibrium. And this is driven by the concentration gradient. It does not require any added energy. But there are many cellular processes that do require energy. They are endergonic, meaning that energy is required. And an example of that is active transport, where cells pump substances from a low concentration to a high through a transport protein, and that's going to require energy. Another example is when ribosomes read the genetic code in mRNA and assemble amino acids into the growing protein. This is a very expensive process, and that requires energy. A final example is when vesicles are moving along microtubules as their train track. They move along using what's called a motor protein. So when a transport vesicle is moving from the RER to the Golgi, or when a secretory vesicle is moving from the Golgi to the plasma membrane, it moves along this plasma or this microtubule and the motor protein takes energy to move that vesicle. So what do cells use for energy? What's their currency? What is cellular money? Well, it's a molecule called adenosine triphosphate or ATP for short. You don't have to use the full name. You can always just use ATP. So here is a picture of an ATP molecule. In blue here is adenine, which is a nitrogenous base, which should ring a bell for you. And then we have ribose, which is a five carbon sugar. And then there are three phosphates. If this looks familiar, it's because it's very similar to the nucleotide that is the monomer for nucleic acids. The monomer for nucleic acids, would you were just looking at the nitrogenous base, the sugar, and one phosphate. ATP has three phosphates. And we call these bonds holding these phosphates high energy bonds. Why is ATP a high energy molecule and why are those high energy bonds? Well, these phosphates, they are all negatively charged. So they repel each other. Similar charges don't like being near each other. That makes those bonds right there holding those phosphates close to each other, they are very unstable. And unstable translates into high energy in the thermodynamics world. So ATP is used as an energy molecule for three general types of processes in the cell. Active transport, organelle movement, and making reactions happen. So how was ATP used as an energy source? Well, let's look at our ATP molecule here again. That last phosphate on the ATP can be taken from the ATP and placed on another molecule. In this case, I've put it onto a protein. The act of taking a phosphate from an ATP and putting it on another molecule is called phosphorylation. We would say that this protein has been phosphorylated and that is just placing a phosphate on another molecule. When you place a phosphate on another, uh, on another molecule, it changes the shape of that phosphorylated molecule because phosphate is very negatively charged. And as we know, when you change the shape of something, you change its function. So how does just transferring that phosphate from ATP to, in my example, a protein, transfer energy and make things happen? Well, I have an example here of a vesicle moving along a microtubule, and this is showing the motor protein actually walking along the microtubule. And if you could envision this motor protein, every time it steps up, it's phosphorylated, down, dephosphorylated, up, phosphorylated, down, dephosphorylated. In other words, just changing the shape could make something step up, step down, step up, step down, and changing the shape of that molecule by adding a phosphate, removing a phosphate adding a phosphate, removing a phosphate, could allow that motor protein to pull the vesicle along the microtubule. And another example is active transport, where we're moving molecules against a concentration gradient. So let's look at this picture here. We have our molecule moving into a transport protein embedded in the membrane. 
and it's open on this side, but it's closed on the inside. If we added a phosphate to that molecule, that could change the shape of the molecule so that it now opens on the inside and is closed on the outside, allowing that molecule to move from the outside, once it's phosphorylated, to the inside. That, eight, that phosphate would eventually fall off, and then the molecule would move back to, I'm sorry, the transport protein would move back to this shape so that another molecule could move in to be transported again. How about making chemical reactions happen? How does phosphorylation help with that? Let's look at this reaction I have pictured here. And let's just imagine that the shape of our two reactants were both in this kind of square or rectangle shape. They're very stable. And if you could imagine them kind of sitting on a table, neither one of these is going to move towards the other. And they would of course have to make contact in order for a reaction to happen. But these are very stable molecules. They aren't going to make contact because they are stable and they're not moving. So there will be no reaction. But how about if we put a phosphate on molecule A and that changed its shape and that made it round. Round molecules now could roll and interact with compound B, allowing them to form a reaction and form compound C. So how does the cell make more ATP? Because there's something that I haven't mentioned, but that has been showing up in each of these pictures of reactions that happen with phosphorylation. If you remember the transport protein, when the ATP put a phosphate onto the transport molecule, it then became ADP, adenosine diphosphate, because it lost one of the phosphates. The same thing in the reaction where we tried to make the chemical reaction happen. ATP put a phosphate on molecule A so that this could change its shape and roll into the next reactant, but then that regenerated ADP. How does the cell get from ADP to make more ATP, which is its form of cellular money? Well, cells have to do this. They have to make more ATP by adding a phosphate back onto the ADP. And that is a very expensive process. And that's shown here, where we would put another phosphate back onto ADP to make ATP. Expensive processes that take energy are called endergonic processes. So where does the energy come from to put another phosphate on ADP to reform ATP to make more cellular money? Well, it comes from us eating food. And that's going to be the subject of the next several videos on this playlist, where we learn how bodies are able to take the molecules in food and transfer the energy from that to making ATP from ADP. So this whole cycle here is known as the ATP cycle where ATP, which has its three phosphates and their high energy bonds, the phosphate is then placed on another molecule to transfer the energy to that molecule, but then that generates ADP. The ADP has to have a phosphate added to it to go back to ATP, and that is known as our ATP cycle. So what you should know. You should know what are some processes that require energy in the cell. What does ATP stand for? What does ADP stand for? You should be able to label the parts of an ATP molecule. You should know why ATP is a high energy molecule. And you should understand how transferring the phosphate from ATP to a protein transfers energy and can make things happen. You should also be able to diagram the ATP cycle where ATP goes to ADP and back to ATP again. So that's all for tonight.